In this presentation, we'll discuss best practice guidelines for ensuring that your CFD simulations are accurate. Various errors can affect the accuracy of CFD results. So in this presentation, we want to talk about the causes of each different error type and what we can do to minimize them. The objective is to understand what causes errors and perform the simulation in a way that minimizes error. CFD results are used for many different stages of the design process and for many different purposes, including design and optimization of components and machines, safety analyses, and virtual prototypes. When undertaking a CFD model, it's useful to consider the purpose of the work, including what the results will be used for and what level of accuracy is needed, as this will influence many decisions that are made throughout the process of building the model and running the simulation. Our first topic is the different kinds of errors that can affect CFD simulations. Several different factors can affect the overall solution accuracy, with the items becoming more significant the further down the page we go. Errors include round-off errors, which are related to the precision of the computer's arithmetic operations, and iteration errors, which are the difference between the solution at a particular iteration n and a converged solution. There are also solution errors, which are the difference between a converged solution on the grid that you're using and the exact solution of the model equations, which is what the solution would be on an infinitely fine grid. Finally, there are modeling errors, which are the difference between physical reality and the exact solution of model equations on an infinitely fine grid. These errors often attract the most attention, but all other kinds of errors should first be eliminated. In the next slides, We'll discuss each type of error in more detail. Roundoff errors are any inaccuracies caused by machine roundoff. These can occur in some situations when there are very high aspect ratio cells or large differences in length scales or large ranges in values of variables. The procedure for checking the importance of roundoff errors is to check for the criteria just mentioned and calculate the solution in double precision Double precision is selected when you start fluent, as you see in the launcher panel here, or if you have fluent open and you're not sure whether you're using single or double precision, look for the DP in the title bar of the fluent window. The way you can tell if there are round-off errors is to define important quantities in the calculation, which we'll call target variables, and these might be the lift coefficient on an airfoil or the temperature at a certain location. Different things will make sense in different problems. Calculate the solution once with single precision and once again with double precision and compare the values of the target variables. If they are different, then double precision should be used for subsequent calculations. Iteration error is the difference between the solution at a given iteration and the solution when the variables no longer change as more iterations are performed. To check for iteration error, first define your target variables, which might be head rise, efficiency, mass flow rate, whatever makes sense for your problem. Next, select a convergence criterion for the residuals and plot the target variables as the solution iterates. Then select another tighter residual convergence criterion and continue iterating. And repeat this until the target variable plots show that they are no longer changing. As it says on the slide, this way you will know how low the residuals should be to ensure that you're not getting any iteration errors. When you do this, it's best if there is a monotonic decrease in the residuals, although that's not always possible. And finally, at each convergence level, be sure to check flux reports for mass and energy balances. This is an example investigating iteration error in the simulation of flow in a 2D compressor cascade. The objective of the simulation is to determine the isentropic efficiency of the compressor using CFD. Pressure contours are shown in the image superimposed over the residuals plot. As the simulation proceeds, the residuals are plotted every iteration, as seen on the left, and the isentropic efficiency is also plotted every iteration, as seen on the right. When judging this solution, we want to see a steady decrease of the residuals, which is true here, and we also want to see that after a certain number of iterations, the target variable, 
again in this case isentropic efficiency, stops changing as additional iterations are performed. The plot on the right shows that the isentropic efficiency is no longer changing at around 100 iterations, and the black lines on the curve indicate where the residuals have fallen below certain threshold levels. The leftmost black line corresponds to the upper blue vertical line on the residuals plot, the center black line to the next vertical blue line, and so on. We can define iteration error as the difference between the value of the target variable when the solution is converged and the value at some other iteration, n. The goal is to identify the residual level below which the iteration error is no longer significant and use that as a convergence criterion for other simulations of similar problems. Here, the difference between r max equals 10 to the minus 3 and r max equals 10 to the minus 4 is quite small, so we would probably say in this problem we want the residuals to drop to 10 to the minus 3 to ensure that there's no iteration error. In other problems, we might find that different values are needed for r max. Now we will talk about discretization errors. All discrete methods have solution errors, whether it's finite volume methods, finite difference methods, finite element methods, and so on. As the slide says, discretization error is defined as the difference between the solution on a given grid and the exact solution on an infinitely fine grid. Although the exact solution to a problem is generally not available except for a few academic cases, and an infinitely fine grid is generally not achievable, as we'll see next, there is still a way to estimate the discretization error by performing a mesh resolution study. This example uses a simulation of an impinging jet flow with heat transfer. Flow is directed from the jet opening to the plate, where it turns and goes radially outward along the plate. The simulation is a 2D axisymmetric simulation, and it's performed on a sequence of increasingly fine grids, going from 50 by 50 cells to 800 by 800 cells. The SST turbulence model was used, and calculations were made using both first-order and second-order upwind discretization. The target quantity we'll use to judge the discretization error is the maximum Nusselt number on the surface of the plate. The results of the study are shown on this slide. The y-axis of this plot shows the maximum Nusselt number on the bottom wall as calculated on the different grids. The x-axis is the inverse of the total number of cells, so the left of the graph represents calculations performed on the finest meshes. The results from the first-order calculations are shown in blue, and the results from the second-order calculation are shown in red. The very leftmost point on the curves is obtained from an extrapolation technique. The grid shows that A, if the grid is fine enough, either first-order or second-order discretization give the same solution, and b, the second order results on the coarser grids are always closer to the final solution, which is why it's always recommended to use second order discretization. Obviously, as meshes for CFD regularly have cell counts in the millions, it's not practical to create five different meshes for every problem. However, we do still want to check that there is a low level of discretization error. So typical alternatives include comparing first and second order solutions, and also comparing solutions where grid refinement has been performed in at least some regions of the mesh. The next kind of errors we will talk about is model errors. They result from inadequacies of the underlying, sometimes empirical mathematical models used to describe various physical processes included in the simulation. These can include inconsistencies of model equations, for instance, inviscid calculations using the Euler equations as opposed to turbulent flow calculations with the RANS model, or the inability of a given turbulence or combustion or multiphase or whatever kind of model to completely accurately represent the physics of a given problem. Modeling errors are responsible for discrepancies between data and calculations that remain after all other numerical errors have been eliminated. But remember that these other errors should be eliminated before becoming very concerned with modeling errors. An example of model errors in the impinging jet case can be seen here, where the flow has been calculated with different turbulence models. In this case, the models are the standard k epsilon model, which is labeled SKE, the RNG k epsilon model, which is labeled RNG, and the standard k omega model, 
which is labeled KW. The plot on the left shows the Nusselt number on the plate as you go radially outward from the center line. The difference between the data and the CFD results is caused by model error, or at least that is assuming that there are no errors in the measurements. The different models used here show different levels of modeling error in the plot on the left, and this can be highlighted from the contour plots of the turbulent kinetic energy across the top of the slide, which show clearly that very different predictions can be obtained depending on which model is selected. In particular, what happens here is that the K-epsilon models overestimate the production of turbulence at the stagnation point, which causes the Nusselt number to be overpredicted near the stagnation point, which we see in the plot on the left. Studies like this one are important because they can help to show what model is likely to have the lowest error in similar flows. Solution accuracy can also be diminished by systematic errors. This can result in discrepancies even if model and numerical errors are insignificant. Systematic errors can result from approximations of geometry, like we see in the images on the right, where some of the details of the surface have been paved over by the mesh, or they can also result from modeling just a component instead of a larger part of the system, or from uncertainty regarding boundary conditions, or fluid, or material properties. The most effective way to minimize systematic errors is to really understand the application in physics. It's possible to look at the pictures on the right and think that the mesh must be bad because some details are missing. But depending on the application, this might not have any effect on the results. If you understand the application in physics, then you will know what level of geometrical detail is needed. Regarding systematic errors, it is good practice to document and justify any assumptions that are made. And also, if there are things you are unsure of, to perform an uncertainty analysis in order to be able to judge the effects of your assumptions. In this presentation, we have discussed best practice guidelines for performing accurate CFD calculations. We've noted the value of engineering knowledge and understanding of the actual physical system. We have seen and discussed the different kinds of errors that can affect the solution. It's valuable to document and to be able to justify all aspects of your model including assumptions about geometry, boundary conditions, flow regime, and physical model selection. Sources of systematic error have been noted, and these can include any approximations you make, such as where to locate the computational domain boundaries, or how to simplify the geometry, or any assumptions you make about data like boundary condition values and material properties. And finally, it's useful to remember that the accuracy expected from a simulation should generally not exceed the level of assumptions that were made in defining the simulation.